Hi everyone, I'm Roger Schoenfeld from Ithaca SNR. And I am joined by my colleague Oya Rieger, also from Ithaca SNR. And we are going to be talking to you today about some work we've been doing to look at the preservation systems landscape. Um, so if I could have the next slide. This is a project that was uh, funded, has been funded by IMLS, uh, for which we're extremely grateful, that where we're looking at the what we've characterized as the effectiveness and durability of digital preservation and curation services. As, 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 you, as you probably realize, this is part of a broader agenda that a lot of us have been concerned about around preservation over the course of time. If our preservation systems and infrastructure isn't fit for purpose, then as much resource as we put into preservation, we may find ourselves with weaknesses in the system. So um, Oya and I have been um, working together and with some other colleagues on a project to look at this landscape and examine ultimately where there are practices that are working well and where there are some gaps that we think may need to be addressed. Um, the project goals at a, at a really high level is looking at what we've called digital preservation and curation systems, how they've been uh, not just developed and not just deployed, but, but today how they're being sustained. Um, we're looking at this not from some kind of idealized perspective. Um, we're really looking specifically at the business approaches that these initiatives have been using, um, both not-for-profit, uh, as well as profit-seeking initiatives, both community-driven and commercial initiatives. We're re really looking across the landscape and trying to do some comparative analysis as part of understanding those, um, those business approaches and, and what's working and, and what it's not. And our second uh, goal, um, sorry, I'm uh, still, still on the goals, if we can go back for a second. Our second goal is to really look at sustainability principles, um, trying to design actionable recommendations and ultimately helping the client organizations, the libraries, museums, um, the, the community organizations that need to use digital preservation systems, um, figure out how to, make, how to make good choices in an environment of some complexity. Now we can tap the next slide, please. Um, and so in a nutshell, we want to separate two different kinds of systems that are important for digital preservation purposes. So um, the, 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 the first set, which we're not looking at in this project, but are, are very important for our work uh, broadly, are cross-institutional efforts that, that curate, that preserve specific content types or collections. Um, and, you know, we've got a few examples of some of these. They could be electronic journals. They could be digitized books. They could be um, the, the web broadly. Um, but, but efforts that where the curatorial work is taking place by a what from the perspective of an individual library or museum is a third party organization. There's a second type of digital preservation work that is really, really important that that the institutions that typically hold print or tangible versions of materials um, have been looking for how to support their efforts to curate, to make discoverable, to provide long-term management and preservation of their own institutional digital content. And these, these organizations, sometimes they use internally developed digital curation and preservation systems. And in other cases, they're using third party systems and services. Those are the focus of, of our project that we're reporting on today. So, um, so in the next slide, um, I'll just share very quickly about the research methodology and then I'm gonna turn things over to Oya in just a moment. Um, what we've been doing is we've been looking broadly uh, through desk research and, 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 and our own experience and otherwise um, about some of the dynamics of these, of these systems broadly. We've done some landscape review, et cetera. Um, and then we selected eight of these systems for close examination. Um, the team conducted interviews with leaders of the systems, uh, contributors to the work, users, non-users, clients, non-participants, et cetera, trying to understand things not only from the perspective of the um, creators and maintainers of these systems, um, but also from uh, user communities, clients, et cetera. 
we drafted, um, we, we, we dug, dug deeply into these eight um, into these eight systems and used them um, distributed across commercial, non-commercial, profit-seeking, community, et cetera, organizations. We, we, we did what is essentially a kind of, of case method to look at how um, at, at what we could learn broadly from some comparative analysis across those. Um, but we did make a commitment not to share, you know, private information about them. So we really, we really, um, we, we, we had access to some additional information from these interviews that, that allowed us to learn with some richness beyond what is sometimes publicly reported, what's working and what's not across these, across these systems. And uh, and and I should just say that um, these are these are those eight systems. I won't I won't read them all out, um, but you know you'll recognize hopefully many, if not if not all of of these as uh, as digital curation and preservation systems. But in our in our report, what we really want to emphasize more so than this one is doing well at this and that one could be doing better at that. What we really want to emphasize is a broad set of cross. Um, you know, cross system analysis that we believe uh, we believe can provide some value to the community, not only in thinking about which systems uh, may make sense for which institutions to use, but more broadly around how these investments can be um, and how investments in these systems can be can be optimized in the future. So now I'll turn things over to uh, to Oya to walk through some of what we've found. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Roger. Uh, so. I'm going to be happy to share our findings on our little team's uh, behalf, but I want to first uh, indicate that our findings should be approached as an empirical snapshot of the insights and perceptions rather than broad characterizations of the uh, digital preservation and creation marketplace. Well, in many ways, uh, digital preservation is such a well-established concept. However, what it really means and how it is put into practice vary widely among institutions. For some, reformatting legacy media such as AV is digital preservation. And for some institutions, digitizing um, analog special collections count as digital preservation. And this is just really to offer two quick examples. Heritage organizations rely on a range of solutions based on their resources and needs and missions, so on and so forth. And uh, the term preservation is really kind of turning into a cliche in a way, uh, in the sense that, uh, in the sense that uh, providers are marketing their offerings as preservation systems, regardless of actual functionality or storage configurations. Uh, many systems marketed as preservation systems usually address only some aspects of the preservation uh, work. Here, actually, I have a very simple life cycle chart. And in reality, it's not as linear, but digital preservation, uh, it really is composed of uh, multiple processes, as I said, not only linear. So thinking about this uh, life cycle, Another issue that we want to mention is digital preservation involves a network of systems and people with various dependencies. Uh, for instance, how digital content is created uh, and processed within an organization has implications for preparing content for a preservation repository. And it's not easy to align systems. I'm not going to read it, but here is a quote from an uh, interviewee from a library where this person is emphasizing the complex uh, system landscape that each organization operates in, including integrated library systems, institutional repositories, uh, research data repositories, web archiving systems, so on and so forth. So uh, we actually, as Roger explained, we looked into both uh, commercial systems and also not-for-profit systems. We really are not uh, intending to binarize the landscape, but we just wanted to kind of highlight some of their characteristics. 
And, um, and one thing that we noticed, and I think this is really kind of obvious to those of us in the, her in the heritage uh, sector is that, you know, we have legions to mission-driven organizations. And, uh, you know, there is definitely preference for supporting uh, kind of value-driven initiatives. Um, however, you know, running, implementing an open source uh, or a community-based system that requires um, uh, active participation from a hosting institution can be, you know, very demanding, especially if you don't have access to developers and DevOps. It's hard to retain staff. So therefore, what we have seen is uh, uh, different heritage organizations, as they are selecting a system, uh, they, of course, uh, prefer to work with value-driven organizations, but they're also trying to find uh, partners uh, that are based on their resources and abilities. I'm going to actually read this quote from a, a library staff. This person said, I'm very much on the side of open source. Within the library up to the dean, there's an understanding of the benefits of open source and free systems, including open educational resources and open access materials. However, there's very much a strong impulse to use commercial systems of large vendors for our services. Uh, one of the most concerning elements of a digital preservation system is a fear that it will be difficult and uh, potentially impossible for the client to move to an alternative system or service. Uh, and commercial service providers are very well aware of the sentiment and they understand that uh, some uh, organizations are afraid that heritage materials might get locked. Um, however, this is really a concern uh, for both commercial and not-for-profit systems, as they all need to really uh, discuss and plan their ag exit strategies, whether it's mergers or whether it's entering a new, new phase. Technologies are evolving. And actually, here's a quote from another um, uh, staff, and actually this is representing um, a commercial service provider. This person said, if you can't exit from our preservation system, it is not a preservation system. The question is not whether you can get your content out or not, it's how complex it is to get out. Not-for-profit solutions, uh, you know, in means of looking at risk factors, uh, they are prone to risks as they tend to have limited capital, limited resources, and they have comparatively demanding governance structures. As a result, some uh, have not been able to innovate quickly enough to keep up with the needs of heritage organizations. Uh, many universities, actually one trend we have observed is that many universities have uh, either centralized or in the process of centralizing their IT units to allow more cohesive governance and also for fiscal management. And actually this trend is kind of worrisome from the library's perspective because it reduces their flexibility for setting priorities and also for having specialized IT staff, especially with deep understanding of preservation issues. Um, here is uh, what we heard from a library staff, which was really a very common sentiment. It's becoming harder to use open source tools and the university is moving towards enterprise systems, especially to fulfill security issues. The commercial system providers we talk with, uh, they are growing. They are uh, actually expanding the different sectors, for instance, biomedicine, but they're also actively talking with heritage organizations to introduce their systems or to respond to uh, RFPs. And this growing reliance, you know, it could be seen as a risk too, but we must note that, uh, you know, both, uh, both commercial providers and not-for-profit not for providers, they all seem to be very committed to what they are doing and believe in the importance of building and supporting a community. Um, 
for commercial entities, uh, although we had very candid conversations with our colleagues who present in commercial uh, services, uh, clearly, you know, there is not full fiscal and technical transparency. So it's difficult to understand the robustness of the solutions. However, they really stress competitive pricing and they have a very strong service-driven approach to drive growth. Digital preservation landscape is complex and dynamic. Uh, expectations and ad attitudes vary, especially based on organizational resources and priorities. Uh, this is really kind of a double-edged sword in a way, uh, because this is a strength allowing organizations to contribute on their own terms based on their means. However, uh, this could also be a risk factor if you look at the diversity of approaches, especially if we have this broad stance of there are no rights way of doing preservation or perhaps um, unwilling to or shortage of uh, talking about the available options, uh, uh, shortcomings and problems. Since the framing of digital preservation as a critical program area in the early 1990s, a considerable amount of progress has been made. You know, we really want to acknowledge and highlight the preservation community's dedication and hard work. It was definitely beyond the scope of this study's research, but our study in means of interviews with both commercial vendors, uh, not-for-profit service providers, and uh, heritage organizations. Everybody pointed out to a growing gap between the institutions with resources and those with limited expertise and staffing. Uh, actually, I'm going to read this code. I think it very well articulates the point here. This person said, I'm quite concerned that we are trying to attend to locally owned or digitized content and have not even started to think about how to archive stuff like research data or social media with a range of rights management and privacy requirements. Uh, so let me let us actually conclude by uh, sharing with you kind of three issues, maybe overarching observations. The first one is, it's really difficult to uh, compare different systems. And I can just imagine how difficult it is for potential clients. If you look at the website of uh, uh, different uh, solutions, different service providers, it's very difficult to compare their features, competitive advantage, product distinction, and categories of content preserved. It is unclear. One library staff said, I believe that what a digital preservation solution actually is very unclear. All of them support OIS and still all of them are completely different in many ways. The second broad observation is, how do we assess different elements of the preservation landscape? You know, we have stewardship commitments with stewardship organizations, we are talking about effectiveness of preservation systems. And then there is you know, well-being of preservation repositories. The assessment metrics and processes that garnered great attention of the community, perhaps uh, you know, 20 years ago, seem to really lose their initial appeal. So I think we wanted to kind of highlight it with an observation, the importance of evaluating the reliability, commitment, and readiness. The third point that we want to make is uh, we looked into 40 preservation systems and then zoom into eight. And uh, you know, I think it's, it's really good to have competition. Heritage organizations greatly benefit from a rich array of services, whether they are not for profit or heritage uh, or, or for profit. And I think uh, we will all benefit from uh, shaping the commercial offerings to serve the best interest of the heritage community. And we have seen the examples of coupling not-for-profit systems or open source systems with professional services offered by vendors. It's emerging as an effective strategy, especially for organizations with limited resources. Uh, 
So our study aims not only to further increase our understanding of sustainable principles, but also to foster a discussion of the preliminary findings. Therefore, uh, we are going to be publishing a report toward the end of this month. And then we will have a series of conversations. We will convene forums to share the findings with key stakeholders, especially service providers, funders, policymakers. And then based on what we are hearing, we will publish in early 2022 a report to incorporate the feedback gathered through the stakeholders. Roger and I want to thank you for attending this session. And we look forward to hearing from you. Please don't hesitate if you have any comments or questions. Thank you.